This is Anna, and this is Check It at the Round Table, where we discuss movies, books, music, and stuff. Today, we are discussing Red, Right, and Blue, the original Amazon movie based off of Casey McQuiston's New York best-selling book of the same name. So, today, I watched this movie twice. I was actually up, because I'm living in Asia right now, so I got up early, I checked, it was like, it's supposed to come out at 10 ET time. What is that where I am now? So anyway, I got up early. I kept waiting. They told me it was unavailable. Then it said it wasn't sure when it was coming out. And I'm like, it bloody well better be out on the 11th. I'm like, I took the whole day off. Most of my students from Japan are off on mountain holiday in Japan. I'm like, I am off on red, right, and blue premiere day. And I am not doing any lessons. I am watching this movie twice at least. So, I watched this movie. It was fabulous. I have to say, I really, really liked this movie. I am not a huge fan of Amazon original movies because I find them to be not particularly well made, typically. However, I think with Red, Right, and Royal Blue, the thing I found interesting was even though it diverged from the book on several features, like, for example, Alex's parents are both still married in the movie, whereas they are divorced in the book, and he has a stepdad, too. And he has a sister in the book, June, and in the movie they just have Nora basically play both June and Nora's part from the book. So there are quite a few changes, and also it is a bit rushed. If you're used to the book, it's not going to be the same at all. And I can say that because I have read the book now. I read the book with some skipping involved <laughs> because there were some spicy bits and I'm not talking about, you know, a pot of mint or basil in the room. I'm talking about, you know, spicy bits. I was like, I didn't know you could put that in the New York Times bestseller, but we're just going to skip and go to the next part. Okay, next morning they're having no great tea. Okay, I like that part. <laughs> so anyway, and it's not because it's a PL drama. It's just because... I'm not into spicy parts. I never have been. It's like, I remember being a kid and my younger sibling would be like, I want the remote because I know you. I'm like, yes, I don't like seeing other people. Yeah. I'm like, I just would rather not even think about that. Just, you know, not my thing. But anyway, back to the review. So the book is very different from the movie. Now, in some ways, even though I did think the book was a had too spicy for honest taste. I really did enjoy parts of the book and I am going to make a separate review on the book which I rarely do because it does have spicy bits and I have tried to read some other books and basically threw them up in a flaming ball of fire because I'm like <laughs> this is not gonna fly with Anna. One of them in particular read a bad buddy book that is the Thai BL Book, and I tried to read that one and I'm like this is nothing like the series it is totally diverging and the series is wonderful it should have gotten all the awards it should get I have collectors two DVD sets of that and it is my all-time favorite Thai Beale drama but well that in Amwe it's a toss-up but anyway my point is, is I rarely will review something that is more adultish in content, but I am going to review the book just so you guys can kind of check that out a little bit if you want. On the movie, it is rated R. Now, there are a couple of good reasons why it is rated R. The movie has a lot of, uh, well, I would say adultish language. Now, it's not like particularly littered with it. Like, I assume that we would be hearing the F word like every other scene, or that there would be a lot of other expletives that would be just riddled in the film. I didn't really feel like there was a huge usage of expletives at all in this production. Like, for example, there were a couple of times when the F word was used, but I will say um, they were mainly with the character of Alec, or I believe Zara, and they were very, very upset, and I'm going, an American would definitely say that most likely. Now, I'm an American and I never say the F word, but that's because personally I just don't really like using that word. If I can think of any other word I could use, like flummoxed, for example, or 
oh darn, you know, things like that. But most Americans would, so I think it was not necessarily necessary to put them in the drama, but I think it was very true to life. The other reason I think this was rated R was because there were some intimate scenes. I think there were only like two extremely blatantly intimate scenes in the entire film, and you could definitely fast forward with form the, through them if that isn't your thing. I didn't find them to be terribly like over the top in any way, and I did prefer the movie over the book with regards to the intimate scenes, which again, kind of fast forwarded through that in the book, and still kind of fast forwarded through that in the movie, but the thing that I did like about the movie over the book is in the book it appeared to me that a lot of the times that the couple of Alex and Henry were having a romantical moment, they were both slightly or sometimes not so slightly drunk. And in the movie, that wasn't the case. Now I will say like with the initial time that Henry kisses Alex at the New Year's party, he is definitely a little snockered, he's had a bit to drink, but that's the only time that really alcohol plays a major part in any kind of romantic entanglement between the two of them. And I really liked the director's kind of respectful way of not integrating as much alcohol use in the movie as opposed to the book. And it's no offense to Casey McQuiston in her original book at all, because I think she had some really beautiful and brilliant parts in her book. But I, I really appreciated the fact that their relationship and their moments together, as it were, were not something that could be talked away with alcohol. They were something that they both had decided on as a couple with full minds and hearts open, as it were. So that was something that I think was much better in the movie than the book. The other thing that I really liked about the movie was we have Henry portrayed excellent by um, the actor called Nicholas, I can't remember his last name, Galavetz, I'm not sure, I might be slaughtering that name. I've seen this actor before, he's, <laughs> he's one of the only, how do I say this, tall, blonde, um, poster card handsome actors that I actually like the characters he plays because he also played in Netflix's Purple Hearts movie which if you haven't seen that Netflix original movie you definitely should it's a very good film I'm not into western rom-coms at all but I really like that movie because it's basically about two people who have massive trust issues massive hurdles to work through and in spite of it all, they are there for each other, even when it's difficult. And it's a very good movie that way. So I'd seen Nicholas G, I'm going to call him because I cannot think of his last name, I should say it probably correctly. So Nicholas G did an excellent job in portraying Henry. I think he got it spot on from the book. I rarely um, see a movie where the lead actor, when it's adapted to film, fits it perfectly. In the same way, I think that the the actor who played Alex did a really good job as well. I was kind of curious, to be honest, about how this movie would fare, so to speak, because even though I'm a huge fan of BL drama, and not because it's BL drama, if you want to go check out my reasons why I like BL drama, and it has nothing to do with being BL, you can check out that podcast. It's down the list from this one <laughs> quite a ways. But anyway, the main reason that I really liked Alex's portrayal and Henry's portrayal in particular is because in Western dramas, we often portray all homosexual males as being somewhat effeminate. And we also kind of make their relationships seem almost slapstick, which I find intensely annoying. It is not because I am against effeminate homosexual men at all, but I think that I am really sick to death of having to explain to my Japanese students, for example, that not are my Korean students when we have free conversation and the topic of homosexuality comes up, which you would be surprised how much that comes up in free conversation sometimes. But interestingly enough, I am really, or not interesting enough, I am really sick to death of having to explain to them that not all 
homosexual males in America are like the gay couple in Modern Family, for example, because most homosexual male couples I have met in real life are nothing like the couple in Modern Family. They are more like, you know, Magnus or Alec from Shadowhunters. You, they're, they of course care for someone of the same gender, but that does not make them really any different from anyone else. It's just they love who they love. So I really appreciated in this drama in particular that we didn't really have a lot of that kind of under the surface what I would call almost hostile environment with which we brought forth this story. So that was really refreshing. The other thing that I really liked is we had a bisexual character with Alex, which was portrayed in a very thoughtful way. Now I will say with Alex's character, I almost prefer him better in the movie than I did in the book. Now my reasons for that are because in the book, how do I say this? Alex likes Henry, loves him to death, but he's also <laughs> kind of liking the other people around him and commenting on how they look and how attractive they are and what we would say have a roving eye, although I know he would never cheat on Henry because he's not that kind of person. It's still a little aggravating in the book. It's like there's a scene where he has, I think, Nora on his lap, Henry to his side, and he says basically the joys of being a bisexual are that I can enjoy both at the same time. Now he's not thinking of sleeping with Nora, that's not the point, but basically he appreciates both genders at once. And the thing is, is that is not what um, I think is the best way to describe a bisexual. So like with the character of Alex in the movie, I think we see much more accurately portrayed in a way is that yes, Alex does like to date girls sometimes and he does like to date guys sometimes. And he has had some relationships with guys in the past and he is like kissing some random girl at the party because he's drunk and stupid. And the other thing I will say is it's important to keep in mind that even though Alex looks like he's older, I think, in this movie, he's only 21 in the story. So I'm like, when you're 21, you're not always making the best decisions, especially when you're at a New Year's party and there's alcohol involved. <laughs> I'm like, that is not the best time to be, you know, making your best cognizant decisions. No. Now, I will say, though, when he is in the movie, kissing random girls at the party. He is not in any relationship with Henry at that point, and it's not, in Anna's opinion, a good good thing to do, but it's not something that I think makes him seem like he's got a roving eye, because he doesn't have any idea Henry likes him at that point, and they haven't started the relationship. And once Alex and Henry start their relationship, Alex is not messing around with anybody else in the entire movie for the rest of it. So I really did like that portrayal. Now I will say that as a person who's extremely logical, I much prefer thinking about people as just liking who they like regardless of gender, like people who are pansexual. I have some friends who are pansexual. And I think in many ways to me, because maybe because I'm extremely analytical and I overthink things to the nth degree, that I tend to like pansexual characters and their relationships in film over bisexual characters and their relationships portrayal in film. Now the reason is, it's nothing against bisexuals and their relationships, and it's nothing for pansexuals and their relationships. The reason that I prefer the portrayal of pansexuals to bisexuals is because really gender has nothing to do with why they like someone. I myself am not a pansexual, so it's not because I'm like uh, pansexual that I'm endorsing pansexuality or saying bisexuality is wrong because I don't think bisexuality is wrong or pansexuality is right. It just is as a viewer in a drama, I tend to prefer pansexual characters because they like their person basically for their essence. It has nothing to do with whether they're male or female, which from a logical kind of 
what you say, impartial standpoint, I think makes a lot of sense. Now, I myself, again, am not pansexual, but I have thought about it, and I'm like, you know, in my situation, if I had a child and they came to me and said they were bisexual, for example, I would not be upset at my child for being bisexual, no. But I would want to know, like if they were with someone, that they weren't with that person just because they happen to be male or just because they happen to be female and they're bi. But I want them to be with that person because they really truly love that person's essence and that person loved their essence. Because at the end of the day, I think that makes a lot more sense than basing our feelings on what gender our other half happens to be. So again, much prefer pansexuals in dramas, but I did like this portrayal of Alex as a bisexual because he really is a good example of someone who, yes, he sometimes dates women. Yes, he sometimes dates guys, but that's really not the thing that defines him. What defines him as a person is who he is and what he decides to do with the care that he has for a person. And I think in many ways the blatant courage of Alex is very, very predominant in this film. Because we have it start out and Alex hates Henry. It opens with Alex basically going through the news with Nora in the limo on the way to the royal wedding um, soiree, as it were, at Buckingham Palace, going, this is ridiculous. I don't want to be there. Henry is always compared to me. I do not like this guy. I want to go. Why don't we go do touristy things instead? Nora's like, no, we are going to the soiree. I want to see Buckingham Palace and this, you know, 75,000 pound cake. And I think it's so funny because Alex is sitting there going, you know, the 75,000 pounds on a wedding cake. And Henry at the same time is on his, with his sister on his arm walking down the, the promenade and basically saying, you know, if the monarchy dies, it's because we spent 75,000 freaking pounds on this cake. It is stupid. And his sister's like, smile for the cameras. We can talk about this later. <laughs> but I think it's funny because even though at this point you can see that they are both not liking each other, they have the same ideals, even shown in the stupid wedding cake that they both detest. So anyway, the wedding cake is turned over because Alex had way too much to drink at that wedding. I'm thinking he had bourbon, like five cups of bourbon or brandy. And I'm going, what in the world would possess you to drink five freaking cups or, you know, half cups of bourbon at an official soiree when you are supposed to be there to represent the United States to the United Kingdom and you totally blow it because you decide to get drunk because you're offended that the prince kind of walked past you. <laughs> I'm going, it's not a good combo. But anyway, the cake tips, the 75,000 pound cake ends up in a smashed, smashed mass on the, um, the floor. At the end of the day, once it's done being a smashed, smashed on the floor, Alex and Henry kind of have to do damage control. So Alex ends up getting a talk down by his mother. <laughs> and um, Zara then hits him with the pillow a few times, tells him he has to get back on that freaking plane and go back to merry old England. And he's like, what if I, you know, light myself on fire? She said, well, if you do that, we'll ship the ashes to Heathrow. <laughs> I'm like, Alex? Zara is kind of like the older sister that you don't love, but you also don't hate because, well, she sometimes does what's needed. So anyway, Alex goes back to London, gets a few pictures, handshaking with the prince, um, ends up going to a um, interview that is just a total disaster, but is very, very hilarious because Alex is trying to annoy Henry. Henry is trying to annoy Alex. Um, Alex says that Henry does great freestyle raps and um, Henry in retort says that he do, um, Alex does a great Barbara Streisand imperpersonation. It's kind of a disaster. 
So anyway, at the end of the day, they both go to a children's hospital and end up getting thrown into a broom closet because there are the sounds of gunshots in the hall. And so Amy is trying to figure out what in the heck's going on, and she threw both the boys into the closet. While they're in the closet, <laughs> um, Henry kind of elbows um, Alex because he landed on top of him, and they're sitting there, and he's like, you know, you have good taste, you have nice cologne. Now, can you please tell me why on earth you hate me as much as you do? And Alex is like, well, you, you snubbed me at the climate conference four years ago and said you wanted to get out of there. And Henry's like, you know, that wasn't the best of things I could have said. I'm sorry that you heard that. I really didn't know that you heard what I was saying to my equerry. But that was kind of a time when I had just lost my dad and I was kind of a prick to everyone. So it was not aimed at you in particular. I was just overwhelmed and you happened to be there at that moment. And he's like, is there something else that happened that, you know, made you upset with me? And he's like, Oh my goodness, that's it. I just, you know, I was upset that day at the climate conference and you have held that as a personal offense that you've kind of polished in your heart of hearts for four years. <laughs> and when Henry puts it that way, Alex seems a little upset that um, he's kind of coming off as a bit petty. And he's like, you know, um, he's going, I, Henry's like, I, I didn't say I wanted to get away from you. I wanted to get away from the whole party. So it wasn't like I was saying I, you know, detest you to all heavens. It's like I just don't want to be around these people right now. And Alex is kind of like, well, when you put it that way, I sound a bit like a prick. And then they get out of the coat closet and it happened to be fireworks that a kid brought in for his friend at the children's hospital. And they shake hands and are supposed to see each other at New Year's party that um, Alex is hosting. So Alex has the um, has his time at the White House when he gets back. He's going to help his mom with this Texas campaign to win it over for the Democratic vote instead of the Republican vote. And so his mom and dad talk about it after he sent a memo to her campaign, which was ignored. Then it got leaked to the press. And his mom finally looked at the campaign and was like, that's a good idea. We'll send you there with a shoestring budget. You can see what you can do. And there you go. I do like how in the, the movie, Alex's mom and dad, it's not like, how is this? They're supportive of Alex, but they also have a very hands-off attitude with their parenting, which I really, really like to see. Because in a lot of movies, you see parents who, they're good folks, yes, of course, but I think they tend to hover over their kids. It's like, when I have my kids, it's not that I will not care for them. It's not that I will not love them. It's not that I will not be there if they crash and burn, because that's going to happen a few times in their childhood and adulthood, I am sure. But I'm also going to be there to sit there and go, I cannot protect them from everything, even if I wanted to. There's too many darn variables. So what I can do is I can provide them with as much as possible to make them successful so that they have the tools they need to get done what they need to get done. And then at the end of the day, if they need my help, if they need me to come and help them and to be there for them, I will be there for them. But I also want them to know that I trust them enough that I'm not doubting their ability to handle things on their own. It's like the thing that was interesting in this drama was when Alex's mom saw his Texas campaign. She's like, you know, this is a good idea. And she talks to Alex's dad and they're like, our son is grown. He wants to be in politics. Let's let him go try this. We'll give him a bit of the campaign money. It's not much. See what he can do. And also let him know that we trust him enough and his judgment enough that we're not worried about how this is going to be. We know that it will be okay. And if it is a total flop, it's a flop that he can recover from. So I really like that kind of unified 
support that Alex has from his parents and also that's shown when like Alex comes out to his mom and um, he that's later on in the story but I love how she responded to that I'm like that is the best Western adaptation I have ever seen of a parent just rolling with things when their child comes out no no real drama just ordering pizza and talking about things but anyway so Alex goes down to actually no excuse me so Alex and Henry chat because Henry gets Alex's number from MI6 <laughs> and they continue to chat and converse and over time kind of build up a repartee with Alex and Henry and Nora and Pez and it's it's really neat I think how they incorporated the SMS messages in the drama like with Henry having to tie that Alex didn't like and Henry saying well gray is a color and Alex having a newspaper article that says he's going to be a father and Henry sending a message that says but we were so careful when you came to London which at that point they do not have any romantic relations at all and it's very kind of comical because I'm like number one you aren't even dating number two that is funny so anyway at the end of the day um, Alex and Henry build up kind of this repartee as it were and I think it's really cute how they incorporated the turkey scene where Alex finds out that the turkey gets a luxury suite at the hotel and he thinks this is a bad use of government monies so he says they should bring the turkey to the White House and they put it in his room Alex sends a picture of the turkey in his bedroom to Henry and they have this really cool like quiet conversation with Alex laying on his bed and Henry laying on the bed just visiting and I think in many ways though this this movie did not really capture the very I mean in many ways I think wonderful email and SMS messages that Alex and him we kind of send back and forth which yes of course there are some spicy bits to their emails and messages in the book but the thing that I really liked about it was mainly that it wasn't very spicy and it really showed how they came to trust and care about one another through those quiet messages that they sent to each other so anyway New Year's party happens Henry comes to the New Year's party it's kind of one of those moments where Henry feels really out of place, but he really likes talking with Alex. There's a scene where they're sitting on the couches laughing and talking. And then as they do this weird dance, Henry and Alex are the only ones who are not getting low, so to speak, when the dance is going on. And I'm going, that is a really good scene because it's almost as if they're the only people in the room. Well, anyway, Midnight happens, Alex gets kissed by two random girls. In the book, that does not occur. I kind of wish in the movie it didn't occur, but I prefer it to some of the things that occur with Alex in the book. <laughs> and his friend Nora, because I'm like, Nora and his relationship in the book I did like, but there were some parts of it that I think were just a little weird. I don't know if it's, I'm like, you know, I think having your best friend is one of those things that you really don't want to date your best friend because then it can get awkward even if you quit dating so anyway that's not happening in the movie but in the book Nora kisses Alex and that's what kind of triggers Henry to walk off with his <laughs> bottle of champagne in the movie the thing that triggers Henry to walk off with his bottle of champagne is the fact that Alex is randomly kissed by these two women at the party we don't know who the women are at the party. I think from what we can see, they're like the American equivalent of a debutante who really just went there five minutes of fame having kissed the president's son, which I'm like, that's a really lousy thing to be. But anyway, so Alex then sees Henry's face just kind of turns kind of ashen and he disappears into the crowd. Well, Alex walks out after Henry and is like, are you okay? What's going on? And Henry's like, I need to get air. And he's like, what would you do if you were an ordinary person? He's like, well, I am an ordinary person. It's just my mom became president and therefore I'm no longer ordinary. And he's like, what would you do, Henry, if you were an ordinary person? He's like, well, I would be a writer. I would move to Paris and I would date more. <laughs> and I'm like, well, 
we know exactly. It's like a list, a bullet point list of what you want in life. And he's like, and Alex is going, Kenny, you are the Prince of England. You know, you could date as much as you want if you wanted to. And Henry's like, I can't date the people I want to date. The people I want to date are not able to be dated by me. And Alex is sitting there, and I don't mean I'm going, the poor man, I mean, he's smart, but his tree didn't go all the way to the top branch on that deal. I'm like, you know, you'd think you could put two to two together on some deals, but I will say Alex had had quite a bit of alcohol before this, and so had Henry, so they're not working at top mental faculty prowess level. But anyway, at the end of the day, Henry stomps over and kisses Alex, and Alex kind of leaning in as they said in while he was sleeping and then Henry just steps back turns beat red and goes oh my god I'm sorry and runs off then Alex tries to text Henry a few times basically asking are you alive can we talk about this da 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 he then goes and talks to Nora who she says you know Henry and New Year's he kind of um kissed me and I'm not sure what to do with this and I was like well I kind of saw that one coming but I'm I'm here for you we can talk about it and he's like how did you possibly see this one coming and Nora's like well Alex Henry is kind of gay like I love how she says like you know the first 50 rows of Gaga gay <laughs> she's going how did you not know this Alex did you not realize he's gay and he's like well he always has a girlfriend and and she's like um Alex, a prince is not allowed to date, if they're a British prince, a guy, because that would be seen as, like, overthrowing the kingdom, as it were. So, of course, he has a girlfriend, but that doesn't mean that he is not gay. And he's like, well, I, I don't know what to do with this information. And Nora's like, okay, well, let's just deal with the fact that Henry kissed you. What do you think of this? Like, what is the observable data on this fact? <laughs> And he's like, well, he's like, when it happened, I realized the difference between football and rugby. And I'm going, it's interesting what comes to people's minds when, when the hormones rage, but okay. And she's like, okay, so you, you realize there's a difference between football and rugby. I'm glad you've come to this mind altering knowledge. But she said, what are you thinking about it? And she said, have you ever, you know, dated or, you know, had a relationship with a guy before? Or is this like your first situation that this has ever occurred? And he's like, well, in high school, there was a guy I liked and the reporter from Politico. And she's like, the reporter from Politico? And he's going, yes, but that was a one-time situation. I decided it wouldn't work because he was a reporter. And she's like, okay, so you think the closeted Prince of England is a better choice <laughs> than the American reporter of Politico. She's like, you know, basically, you can pick him, Alex. <laughs> but anyway, she's like, well, um, what are you going to do about this situation? He's going, well, Henry is supposed to be here um, for the prime minister's dinner, so I will try to talk to him then. Do you think he'll talk to me? And she's going, well, we'll have to wait and see. I don't know. So anyway, the dinner happens, they have a, well, not really a conversation, more like a head-smashing moment <laughs> in a pink room, red room, I don't know. Anyway, Amy takes care of that and then is like, um, walks in and goes, hi, 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 it, time's up, but, um, yeah, and then <laughs> poor Henry is really looking at the books very, very studiously at that point. So anyway, then they have their uh, dinner together. In the book, they had dinner first and then had that moment in the red room, but anyway, whatever. And um, plus, I really missed the part that they plied them with, pride Henry with profiteroles. I'm like, that would have been nice to add that. I'm still not sure what a profiterole is. I think it's something chocolate or maybe pastry. I don't know, I'm gonna have to Google that. But anyway, so then they have a moment in Alex's room. Now, I will say that really wasn't like, terribly overdone. I mean, it was a little bit, um, a little bit, but not much. And then at the end, though, I did like at the end of that scene how they're both sitting on the couch, and even though they're trying to act, like, so casual about their relationship, I'm like, 
those two are head over heels crazy for each other and they don't know what to do about it so they're just downplaying it but I'm going and I totally understand why because of the situation in the story I'm like it would be very hard not to be trying to be all casual and downplaying it but that doesn't mean it was maybe the best decision but I love how Alex is just gently holding Henry's hand like I really like you but I'm not sure how to say that and Henry in the same place is sitting there going I really like you and I'm not sure how to say that so I'm going to hit you with a pillow and then kiss you and say goodbye and ask you to come to a polo match I'm like <laughs> Well, we all have ways of expressing affection. I mean, as, as ways goes, hitting people with pillows might not be the best of ways, but it, they're certainly worse. So anyway, they have a moment at the polo match. Then Henry is on his campaign for his mom in Texas. They continue to write and text each other. The Democratic convention happens and Alex is at the convention. He gives a speech for his mom's um, campaign there. He then meets the Miguel guy from political. I'm still not ever sure what Alex saw in Miguel. I mean, no offense, I'm going, I don't mean it weird, but Miguel is like a loser times seven. And it doesn't take a brainiac to see. I'm not saying that people cannot redeem themselves. I'm not saying that Miguel could not become a very good person if he had a fire lit under his hinder parts. But I am saying that I find it highly doubtful and it's so darn obvious. I really don't know because Alex tends to have a good judge of character in the book and also in the movie, but I'm like, what did he ever see in Miguel? I mean, I know he was drunk and that might be the biggest stipulation there. I think, yeah, that could definitely be it. Okay, moving on. So, he sees Miguel at the convention. Miguel basically tries to sidle up to him at the bar and say, well, we're both staying at this hotel. And Alex is like, do you ever think I would be with someone who basically took my information that I didn't even give you to the press and wrote an article without my permission, do you really think that would work? And he's like, well, I guess I don't now, and walks off. And Alex is just kind of, oh no, Alex walks off. And as he's walking off from the bar, he sees Henry coming up with Amy because Henry has arranged to meet Alex at the Democratic Convention. Now I will say, both in the book and in the movie, the timing of the situation with Henry coming to meet Alec. In the book, it was because of Raphael Luna deciding to switch um, from being Democratic to Republican. There's no Raphael Luna in the, in the movie, which I kind of like because we don't have to deal with the whole Jeffrey Richards being a predator thing, which I'm okay with not having in the movie. But, um, Raphael Luna was in the book and that's the reason that Henry came to kind of give Alex a bit of a calm moment in the middle of all that trouble when they switch sides, when Raphael switched sides. In the movie, he's just there because Alex has been campaigning like crazy in Texas, very little sleep, literally collapsing on the bed in a heap at the end of the day and he's like, I could be there for Alex, we could have a bit of a moment and that will kind of relieve Alex's stress at the Democratic Convention. I'm going, I totally get that Henry's heart was in to be there for his person, but I also totally get that that was really like the worst possible place that Henry could have been with Alex. So anyway, the next morning, Henry and Alex are totally conked out at about 7 a.m. and Zara shows up at the door to tell Alex he needs to get down there and do some interviews for his mom and she hears voices in the hotel room and she's like I am coming in who in the earth did you get and I do understand I mean how does this I do not think Zara handled the situation well at all because I'm going Alex is an adult Alex is 21 Alex can do whatever he wants within reason with whomever he wants and he should not be getting judged for it but I also understand Zara's perspective because I'm going it really was the worst possible place for Prince Henry to show up and have this clandestine moment as it were with all the reporters and she's sitting there going 
I can do damage control, but I cannot do damage control for certain things. And we have no preparation for this on how we're going to breach this with the press. And Zara had no idea this was going on either. So Zara rocks in on Alex, not dressed. <laughs> and she's like, and, and Alex is going, Zara, can you please at least let me get my clothes on? And Zara is like, you know, you had someone in here and you had someone in here with their phone who God only knows what they were recording on their phone. So don't sit there and act all okay because your mom is literally getting ready for her election campaign is almost done and you did not have this person sign a NDA because I have all the NDAs of every person you've basically been with and we are in a hassle load of trouble. So she's walking around the apartment, or the suite, trying to figure out who on earth this woman she thinks is, when she opens up the cupboard and finds Prince Henry in boxers and a white shirt, which is better than she found Alex, I will be the first to admit, but she's sitting there trying to breathe because it's not so much, I think, that the fact that Alex is dating a guy that's bothering Zara really at all. The fact that's bothering Zara is she had no idea that Alex was dating the spare heir of England, and this has so many political implications that are running through her brain at the moment. So anyway, Zara is sitting there trying to breathe, trying to stay calm, and at the end of the day, she's like, you know, would it make any difference if I told you never to see the prince again? And Alex is like, nope, that's not really gonna change my mind on this deal. And so Zara's like, okay, then what we're going to do is I'm going to go downstairs and wait for you in the lobby. And you'll be down as soon as possible because we really do have to do those interviews for your mom's election. And you, she says to the prince, are going to get on a plane and go back to merry old England and I want you to have a crumpet by this afternoon so no one even knows that you've been gone because if they find out that you have been here in the Democratic Convention Hotel I will Brexit your head from your body <laughs> and she toodles off and leaves the two boys to figure out how to deal with that so anyway she also does not tell Alex's mom that Alex is number one by and number two dating Henry she's like that is not my deal, and that really is the least of our problems right now. The main problem is he's here in the Democratic Convention, and this is a problem. <laughs> so she leaves. I'm guessing she probably went and got a bit of a caffeine patch or something. And the next scene, we switch to Alex going to talk to his mom. And Alex goes up to his mom and is like, you know, I've been figuring some things out, and I've met someone, and it could have some implications for the campaign. And his mom's like, Oh, sweetheart, I'm so glad you've met someone. She's like, is, is she a Republican? Is that the problem? Because I'm really failing to see why this would have implications for the campaign, and I'm just so happy you found someone. And he's like, well, it's a he, and it's Henry. And his mom kind of stands there, and she she sets back down in her president chair, and she's like, the, the Prince of England, okay. And she grabs her phone, and... And, and Alec, I think, is having all these terrible things come through his mind, and he's like, and she's going, we need pizza, and we need it now. And then the next thing you see is, she's curled up on the sofa with Alex, and she's like, you know, it's okay. I'm not, you know, she's like, I'm, I'm happy you found someone, but you really do need to think about if this person is going to be a forever situation for you, because this is one of those relationships that if even if you guys don't work out as a couple if it continues and the press finds out about it etc this is going to stick with you and this is going to stick with henry for the rest of your lives so you really need to think about if this is something you want to continue on the path of if you really feel forever about him and she says and you need to talk about talk to your dad about it <laughs> so and then she gives him the updated talk because she didn't give him the updated talk when they first had the talk. When he's in high school, he's like, oh God, mom, I don't want to hear this from you. <laughs> but I'm like, you know, I think I think it's good to have the updated talk. I'm like, it was, it was done in a very quick manner with information on pamphlets that she could have sent over. I'm like, 
I've had the talk with kids, but it's not that kind of talk. It's like, I think it's so funny because all my friends are like, you're having the talk with so-and-so. I'm going, why does everyone always think that the talk involves the S word? Sometimes the talk involves other things like life lessons, things that we need to do, how we need to treat others, but it does not always involve the S word. So anyway, I'm like, why do we always think the talk has to involve the S word? Sometimes we have to have the talk on being a good humanoid to other people. Sometimes we have to have the talk on how, you know, if you drop a blazing marshmallow on the carpet of the living room, I am not going to get upset at you because we have a fire extinguisher if you cannot stomp it out. <laughs> Had that talk about a year and a half ago. I was like, my the kiddo that was visiting me at the time. I'm like, you should have seen their face. They were so so stressed out. And I was like, we need to have the talk about if you do light things in fire on Anna's house. I'm not going to get mad about it because I was a kid once too. I used to be 12 and incredibly clumsy, and I lit way more things on fire than I would care to admit. And I survived, but I would have survived far more if I had had parents in my life that didn't yell at me about it. So I'm like, you know, I don't see the point of getting my blood pressure up, yelling at another human being for one thing. Yelling would make my voice sore and I don't need that in my life. So it's like, nah, blood pressure's better. Just stomp it out. If we need to get a new rug, we will get a new rug. So anyway, those are the talks I normally have. But I did admire Alex's mom and her talk. It was short, subtle, and not really subtle. It was like, blazing billboard kind of level talk but still she managed to do the talk shortly briefly and anyway Alex then goes with his dad and Nora to the vacation house they have that they got after his mom got a book deal and um, his dad is there he also invites Henry and Percy to come to I did like how they called him Pez in the book more. I'm like, like the candy dispenser. Yeah, candy and the candy dispenser. But anyway, so they all go to the lake house. And while they're at the lake house, Alex and Nora and Percy and Henry all go for karaoke and way too many tequila shots at a local bar with Amy standing there by the door. And it's in the middle of that night that Basically, Alex is looking up at Henry, singing, I am a supersonic man. I'll make a supersonic man out of you. <laughs> and I'm like, that is funny. But it's at that moment that Alex really kind of has it hit home, that it really is forever for him, that he doesn't want to think about living life without that person. I think it's kind of interesting because usually in our moment in our life we have moments of crystal clarity sometimes it's with people and relationships sometimes it's with just us ourselves i love how like in shadow hunters when alec comes out of the new york institute and he thinks that magnus died because the soul sword was lit and he finds magnus and he gives him a hug and he's like i love you and i care about you and I want you to know that. And I think that really is kind of a pivotal moment in both he and Magnus's life. And Magnus basically says the same thing to Alec. He's like, I was terrified for you the same way you were terrified for me, and I really, really care about you too and love you. And I think that in the same way, we have a similar moment here, even though it's with tequila shots and karaoke, which doesn't seem like a, a definitive, bearing kind of moment in a relationship. But he's looking at at Henry and he's like I so love this person and who they are and I really can't imagine my life without them and I want to start planning not only like my next year but I want them to know that I want them to be a part of my life and I want to be a part of their lives so the next day Henry come is laying on a pier kind of sunning after a swim at the lake or not a pier one of those in lake docks i don't know what you call them but anyway so he's there and alec comes up and kind of shakes himself all over him like a dog and then he starts talking he's going you know i've been thinking and next year my mom will have won the presidency hopefully i will not be having to do all this stuff for the election we could go and have some fun in austin and be here at the lake if we want to wear clothes we can if we don't we can and we could even hold hands and walk down Austin and it will be okay at that point point. and 
I think in many ways it really shows the the open heart and yet naivety of Alex because Alex is only 21 and Alex also hasn't had a lifetime of basically crap spoon fed to him and I hardly ever use that word but I, I think it's appropriate in this context like Henry has where he's been told that he has to repress 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 until there's nothing left of him it's like there's a very touching moment when he is in Paris with Alex and he basically says that Prince Henry belongs to Britain and Henry Fox only belongs to himself until he vanishes and I think in many ways that little moment where Alex is sitting there in Paris and or standing there in Paris and says well can't Henry Fox ever belong to someone else and uh, Henry says only momentarily because Henry is terrified that if his family knows that he is gay and if Britain knows that he is gay it will just cause everything to come cascading down and I don't think it's so much about Henry but what he worries about with his family and in the book like with his sister B having had to deal with cocaine addiction and with his brother being such an unmitigated snob which was accurately portrayed in the movie too I have to say. Now I am kind of glad that they didn't have B have the cocaine addiction in the movie not because I think there was anything wrong with the cocaine addiction but it just added a little less drama to the movie which I kind of like that we didn't have to deal with B having to deal with something with not how this is I like that B didn't have to deal with the press coming after her in the movie like they came after her in the book and so in many ways it was like in the book they were fighting two fires at once in the movie they were just fighting one fire with the king being a repulsive never mind but anyway so at the end of the day as alex is talking to henry about making plans for the next summer henry jumps into the water and just goes down very deep and then goes and swims to shore goes to bed early and leaves that night for britain and he quits texting Alex, quits responding to calls, just basically goes on no, no conversation. Now, I totally get where Henry's coming from. Now, I do not think that silence is the best way to handle a situation usually. Now, there have been a couple of times in my life when I have to say, you know, there are certain things that you really don't have a response for, and it's okay to sit there and go, I have no response for this. Any response that is given to this will not be a good response, and so I'm just going to not respond to this. However, with Henry's, I totally get as well in a similar way that he didn't know how to handle the situation. He didn't see a way that he could keep Alex in his life, and what Alex was asking of him and wanting to share his life with him, wanting to walk down Austin hand in hand. Alex could see that happening, but he couldn't find a way to convey to Henry in a way that Henry could feel safe. Henry could not imagine walking down Austin hand in hand with Alex. It's not something he could ever dream about before he met Alex. And even in the middle of their relationship, when they're sitting there on the docks, all he sees is impossibility. He feels like he has to hide in the shadows and if he love Alex it has to be in bits not as whole because he can't imagine ever being able to trust anyone whole because he feels like everything will come caving down on him and he doesn't have a supportive family I mean no one except his sister would back him up on his choices and maybe his friend Pitt Percy I'm going Percy I think would go to the moon and back for Henry and so would Beatrice as much as she's able, but he has no support from his mother and no support from his brother, and he doesn't know how the British people would react if their beloved prince came out as loving the president of America. So, I mean, no offense, I'm going, it'd be one thing to come out to the nation, it'd be another to come out to the British nation as loving the president of America. So, I mean, that could go both ways. I mean, I don't know. So anyway, Alex ends up deciding after talking with Nora on his bed, Nora's like, you know, I talked to Percy, and Percy says sometimes Henry tends to cocoon and you just have to wait it out because it's how he processes things. 
and she's going, you know, you have frequent flyer miles. You could fly over to Britain, Alex. It's entirely possible. You could be there tonight, as it were. And he's like, well, what if Henry won't see me? And she's going, well, at least you would know then. You wouldn't have to wonder like you are now. And you could go get your man. Isn't it worth at least trying? I mean, wouldn't you rather know that it's not going to work than to sit here and wonder what the heck happened and why is Henry acting this way? So at the end of the day, Henry's up in his bedroom without the horrid bed. I'm like, I'm really glad they didn't put that horrid golden bed in the movie. I'm like, that horrid golden bed from the description, I'm going, it's much nicer to have Henry have a regular, you know, normal looking bed, even though it does have silk sheets. I'm like, well, you know, silk isn't terrible. So anyway, so he's sitting there on his bed and his, one of the maids comes in and is like, I'm sorry, your highness, but Mr. Diaz is outside at the gate yelling that he demands to see you and what you want us to do about this. And so Henry goes downstairs and he's like, you know, you can come up, but you can say what you need to say and then you can leave. And Alex is going, you know, Henry, I don't understand this. We were having a wonderful time. You were happy, I was happy, and then you just leave and you ghost me. And what am I supposed to do with this information? And she's, he's like, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're thinking. What am I supposed to think from this? And he's like, I have not been anything but completely honest with you, Alex. I can want you, I can want to be with you, but I do not want a life in politics. And I don't want to trade my time with the crown for a time with someone who's always going to be under a microscope with politics and that doesn't make me a coward and it doesn't make me you know a bad person it makes me someone with a shred of dignity that doesn't want to have to deal with that kind of pressure and Alex is sitting there going I never thought you were a coward and I will leave but I'm not going to leave if I think that there is any chance I think it's kind of bad because the actor who played Alex actually said that wrong grammatically. He said, I think, I'd, I will not leave if I didn't think there was a chance with you. So I'm like, that's totally not correct English. It actually means the opposite of what he meant to say. But anyway, so he's like, I'm not leaving if I think there is a chance that you want to be with me. So are you going to make me leave, Henry? Because that's going to be what it has to take. So you're going to have to drag me kicking and screaming out of here, basically, because I love you and I know you care about me so even if you don't want to say that you're going to have to tell me to leave to my face in order to get me to leave so anyway I really think that the fact that Alex persisted in his care even in the face of Henry trying to shut him down is what really got him because we know from the story and we know from the movie that Henry had had previous romantic entanglements, as it were. But I don't think he'd ever had anyone willing to fight for him, like Alex was willing to fight for him, because I think he really knew with Alex that Alex, like like in the book, in this scene, basically Alex, in the book, Alex is talking to himself and says, I will love this crazy, never mind head forever. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that's not very polite but he really will in that Henry knows that Alex loves him for who he is and really gets him more than probably anyone Henry has ever been with. So I think in many ways that's why Henry kind of breaks down and in the midst of that breaks down gets courage because basically after that Henry takes him to the Victoria Museum in the middle of the night to the statue area. And he says, you know, this is where I used to come with my dad when we were kids. And I used to dream of maybe bringing the person who I really cared about here. And they would love it too. And we would dance among the statues like no one was watching and it would be a wonderful moment. And that was all just a crazy fantasy. But at that moment, um, Alex puts on a song that's a slow dance song and he dances with Henry in that room. And Henry tells him, you know, if you can be patient with me, I will try for both of us to have the courage to be with you out in the open, but it's going to take me time and it's going to take 
you know, a bit of time. And I don't know how that's going to happen, and I don't know how we're going to deal with this when it does. And I really like how Alex is just kind of sits there and hugs him and is like, it's okay. And when Henry takes him to the airport, Henry gives Alec his signet ring and Alec gives Henry his key, which in the book that did not occur, but I really liked how in the movie, it was like an equal trade of the things that they truly valued and that they felt made them a part of each other, a part of themselves that they gave to one another, instead of Alec having both the key and the ring. So anyway, Alec goes back to America and says basically when he leaves Henry, he's like, I will be as patient as you need me to be because I love you so darn much. So Henry goes back home to the palace. Alec goes back home to the White House. In the middle of all that, um, the emails are leaked. I think there were like 75 of them according to the movie, but there were probably way more in the book, I, I'm guessing. I can't remember how many emails were in the book. But anyway, the emails are leaked in all their Waterloo grandeur. And communication to the White House seems to have been cut. Um, Sean, the equerry, has been trying to get in touch with um, Alec and the staff, but he can't. And in the same way, Alec cannot, Alex cannot seem to get a hold of Henry because all the phone lines have been cut to the departments by the um, king. It's the king instead of the queen. The queen was in the book, but they had to be a king in the movie. At the end of the day, Alec decides to give a speech, and he goes public with it. And I really really love Alex's speech. I'm like, this speech is magnificent in the movie. I'm going, it is an awesome speech. Because basically in the speech, Alex says, you know, this isn't really about me being bi and Henry being gay or us being a queer couple. He's like, that's not what this is about. He's like, what this is about, he said, and, and granted, he's like, you know, those emails are out there for the public to see. And Yes, Henry and I would both prefer that our personal and private and sexual lives were not out there on display for everyone to see. But that is not the real issue here, whether I love the Prince of England and whether he loves me. What the real issue is, is that we should have a right to privacy, and that right has been defiled. And the fact that if we want to be in the closet or if we want to be out of the closet, that is our decision. And that should not be a decision that should be made by someone else. He's like, you know, you have a right to come out if you want to come out, but you also have a right to not come out if you want to not do that. And you have a right to decide that on your own terms and that should not be taken from you by anyone. So he's like, the main problem that we're dealing with here is the fact that privacy has been violated and that should never have occurred. And as he's giving his speech, you also see Henry. And I feel, I mean, I'm going, you know, it's such a terrible situation because Henry is sitting there literally having a panic attack as he gets ready to go deal with his brother who is an, an, just an awful human being who decides to lambast him at his house for a while because he's come out as gay and oh my goodness, we cannot have that. I'm going, number one, it's none of Philip's business what his brother is or is not. I'm like, you know, Henry's not going to be coming out at you because you're straight. Oh my goodness, whatever will we do? <laughs> I'm like, you know, um... It really is one of those things I'm like, I've never quite understood why people get bad because someone is gay or because someone is bi or because someone is pan or, you know, whatever someone is. I'm like, we don't get mad because someone is straight. I love that scene in, in Love, Simon where he's like, you know, why is it that we always have this big to-do when someone comes out? He's like, we don't have this when, oh my goodness, our daughter likes boys. Oh, I'm okay with that. I'm like, you know, seriously, I really think that people need to think about things like that sometimes. It's like, why is it that we think that people are, and they're 
orientation is something that is or is not, you know, our, our business. I'm like, it really isn't. I mean, in, in the green scheme of things, it's like, it, it doesn't, it's none of our business what someone else is or isn't. So anyway, but at the end of the day, I really like how Alex has this very short speech, but basically says, you know, our privacy has been invaded and our ability to come out with this in our own way has been invaded. And someday, I hope that both me and Henry can be a couple in public in the way that we want to be and not in the way that this has happened. And then he says, you know, that's a big issue. But the other smaller issue is he's like, I have fallen in love with this person. And this person happens to be a guy. But I fell in love with them because they are such an incredible person. And in some ways, I think this kind of showcases that even though Alec is bisexual, yes, in some ways, I think he tends to lean more toward pansexuality, especially at the end of the speech, because he's like, I fell in love with this person who happens to be a guy, yes, but I fell in love with them because they are an amazing human being. And yes, they happen to be the prince of a country, but that is not what made me fall in love with them, and it is not what kept me from falling in love with them. So at the end of the day, he's watching his speech with Zara and Zara is sitting on the couch with her heels up in the air and she's like you know what kid I'm proud of you and he's like do you think I cost mom the election she's like you know you might have cost your mom the election and you might have won your mom the election with the speech we won't know but let's wait and see next week and anyway basically I'm proud of you and he's like you know, I wonder if Henry got to see the speech. He's like, you know, Henry would have this little worried brow right here, which is so cute. And I really wish I could just know that he's okay and talk with him. And so I was sitting there going, oh, oh, for goodness sake. And she walks over to the door of her desk and she pulls out a phone and she dials a number and she's like, Sean Shivraska, whatever. I need you to move your, your perfect little self over and you get this phone to the prince. And I know we said this was only for emergencies, but this is an emergency. And I want you to get the prince on the line so I can have the president's son talk to him because if you don't, you will never see me without clothes on again. <laughs> and Alex is sitting there going, Zara, you dark horseshoe. <laughs> and Zara's like, and he's like, I, I, thank you so much. And she's like, don't touch me. <laughs> And she hands the phone to Alex, and Alex talks to Henry, and she and he's like, "Are you okay, Henry?" And Henry's like, "No, I am not okay." And Alex is going, "You know what? I will be there tonight, and just hang on till I get there." And I really like how Henry has had to say he is okay his entire life when he is not okay, and he's finally met someone who he can tell. I'm not okay too. And he can collapse on the stairs with and hug for a while and play Schubert or whatever piano music or Yankee Doodle Dandy or My Country Tis of Thee with. And even in the midst of not being okay, be okay admitting he's not okay with. So I really like that scene because it, it really showcases how Henry can be vulnerable with Alex and in many ways, it's, it's kind of refreshing to see Henry be able to have someone to be vulnerable with after what he's been through. So he and Alex go to meet the king who basically says, we're going to tell everyone that this is a bunch of lies even though it isn't, and you just have to sit there and deal with it because I'm king and I'm not going to support you. I'm just going to lie to everyone about this because they cannot handle the fact that the British monarchy could have a prince who's homosexual going, well, you know, it's happened a few times before, at least in the history of the British monarchy, if history serves me right. And I read a lot about British history, so I'm like, it's happened quite a few times in the history of British rule and other royal family rules. I'm like, it's not like it hasn't happened before, and it'd be much better if everyone were just honest and open, because it would make people 
trust the monarchy a lot better, I think. So anyway, they're dealing with Grandpa being a self-righteous prick. Now, I will say, I think Grandpa is kind of funny because Grandpa actually did read the letters that Alex and Henry wrote one another. And even though I do not like Grandpa, even though I think he is a royal prick and pain, and it's not because I have anything against the real British royal monarchy, I think, you know, there are really good aspects of the British royal monarchy. So even though I'm an American, I, I never really saw the reason that people would be anti the monarchy. So, but... I do like how even though the Grandpa King is portrayed as really kind of a royal prick, he does sit there and go, I have read your letters, and I do know you two boys are in love, and I do know that even though sometimes your love may be expressed in less than idyllic terms in those emails, I have no doubt that you care about each other. Whereas Philip, who is still a royal prick too, and I'm not saying it because they are royal, I'm just saying they are pricks and they happen to be royal, is sitting there going, why would I read your emails? And of course you don't love him. And, and, and Henry is sitting there going, you know, if you read our emails, you would realize that we really do care about each other. And this is not a passing fancy. This is the person who I really want to be with. And I love how at the end of their meeting with the king and the heir to be to the throne, Philip, they are sitting there and Henry has to make a decision of whether he's going out on the balcony against his grandfather's wishes, against Philip's wishes, with Alec in tow, and meeting the royal people that are waiting there at the palace to wave at them and show their support. And his grandfather basically says, if you go out there, there's no turning back. And he looks at Alex and he's like, I certainly hope not. And I love that scene because it's like, you know, I think it's so funny because in today's day and age, most people are like, they don't want to sit there and go, this is forever for this person. I think it's so funny because in, in like the dating websites or whatever, most people say like, I want this relationship to ne last the next few years of my life. And I'm going, you know, there's nothing wrong with the next few years of your life. But isn't it kind of cool when you meet someone that you really want to be there with forever? I mean, not like in a bad, like, ball and chain kind of way. But when you meet someone that you go, this is only going to get better. Why on earth would I not want to be with this person for the rest of our life? And see how we can grow and change together and be who we want to be. And really, basically, kind of, kind of like, again, I'm going back to Shadowhunters, but when Magnus and Alec get married and they have their wedding vows, which I have to say for wedding vows, if I ever do get married, I'm going, I'm going to have to marry a very strange person because our wedding vows will be very similar to Magnus and Alec's wedding vows. I'm like, I have not ever heard wedding vows that were that darn good. But basically when Magnus and Alec are getting married and they say that um, they basically want to be there to help the other person reach their greatest heights. I'm like, in many ways, I think the scene where um, Henry takes Alec's hand and he's like, I certainly hope so, it'll be forever, and we can't go back on this deal. But I think that's very encouraging in this day of modernity when most people think that relationships can only last a year are a few years to see a couple portrayed that is also a queer couple portrayed in such a way that they want it to last longer they want to be there for each other they want to see where it will go the next year and hopefully forever because that's what they're aiming for because they found someone who they really don't want to imagine life without they want to imagine having them have barbecue in austin and get barbecue sauce all over their face even if there are no napkins. <laughs> but anyway, I think in many ways, that's a really interesting and good thing to portray in an Amazon original movie. So at the end of the day, Alex goes back to the US with Henry in tow instead of Alex in tow, like at the balcony of the palace. And he's seeing his mom maybe write a concession speech and it all hinges on Texas. So he's feeling like, it's all something that could go down because he didn't do enough. And Henry and him go to another quiet corner of the 
place they are staying in Austin. And Henry's like, I want you to know that it's not over yet. That yes, Jeffrey Richards has a lot of votes. And yes, it's close. But they still haven't counted all the ones in Texas. And look at my tie. You're always commenting on my ties. And you haven't noticed I have little yellow roses, like the little yellow roses of Texas. And, and, and Alex is like, I am so glad you are here. So at the end of the day, Alex's mom wins the election for another four years. And at the end of the day, Henry asks Alex, um, Alex asks Henry if he still has that key. And he takes him on a bicycle. They go on bicycles to his old house. And they open up the door. And, Henry, and Alex says, you know, we won. And Henry says, yes, we did. And they walk in and Henry's like, oh, you are from a working class family. And he's like, yes, your majesty. And this is where I learned to walk. <laughs> and I was kind of hoping that we would get to see Alex and Henry in Brooklyn at their apartment and the next four years with Alex going to law school at NYU and Henry really kind of becoming more sure of himself and developing as a person and be more comfortable as he got to be in Brooklyn away from all the drama of his home life back in the UK. But I did like how they ended this because I'm like, you know, it's about coming home and it's about winning. And for Alex, home is symbolized by that key around his neck and by having Henry there with him and that signet ring on his finger and being able to bring Henry to his house and being able to have that moment with him, I think was excellent in portrayal. And I think it was a good way to end this. So overall, I would give this movie a rip roaring 10. Now I will say there are certain parts that are not kid friendly. And I hardly ever re um, review our movies. And I hardly ever actually watch our movies. I'm trying to think, and I think the only other R movie I've ever seen Except maybe when I was a child, my parents let me watch a couple of our movies, which I really wish they hadn't because they were, they were violent and scary and gave me nightmares. So I'm like, I don't know why my parents let me watch those R movies. I'm like, I know I was there. I know they wanted to watch them, but still. But I think the only other R movie that I can recall the name of is The Full Monty. And I'm like, but that is an R movie that I like because it's not really about male strippers. It's about being confident in who you are and being okay with yourself. And I do not watch the the X-rated version. I only watch the R-rated version. So, but anyway, I should do a review on the Full Monty. But that's for another time and place. So this is probably one of the few R-rated films I will ever watch in my life. But it is definitely worth watching. I would also be perfectly fine watching this movie with teenagers and even with kids if I fast forwarded through a couple of parts. So I think it really kind of depends on your comfort level of what you're willing to talk about with your children. For me, I would rather have these talks with my kids than to have them be asking their friends at high school or whatever about things because I'm like, it'd be so much better if we had these discussions at home than with a bunch of yahoos. <laughs> so I'm like, I would have no trouble watching this with my kids. And probably, you know, in the next few years, I will be watching this with my kids. Now, I will also be fast forwarding through a couple of choice parts in this film because I don't want to have to explain things to like an eight year old, for example. I'd rather have that talk when they're a little older. But I will probably be watching this with my kids because I want them to see a couple portrayed in a Western drama, not just an Asian drama, because they will be in a house that will have a lot of Asian BLs that they will be watching as well. But I want to see, have them see a Western drama in which they see a couple very happy with one another and working together to have a stronger relationship. So that I think is a very good thing. And I can honestly say, like, I took today off. I watched this movie twice. I hardly ever take a Friday off. But I was like, you know what? It is National Mountain Day for my students, and it is national premiere of Red, Right, and Blue for me. So I'm like, I am taking today off. I was going to get a nap, and that did not happen. But I'm like, I did get the movie watched twice, and I did get this review, which will go up tonight. But, you know, I haven't felt homesick for the U.S. since I left, which is in a way kind of sad to me because I'm like, I really thought I would be missing like different things of the US, but honestly living in Asia, it's it's so safe. It's 
so very clean compared to where I lived in the U.S. I'm like, the cost of living is so much cheaper. The healthcare is amazing. And it's not that I have anything against the U.S. at all, because I'm an American and I always will be. I don't see me ever changing citizenship. But watching this move me may, may be a little homesick for the States. And the reason is, is when when Alex and Henry are throwing their bikes on the yard and going into their house and saying, we want, I'm going, that is truly kind of an American mindset. The kind of the whole devil may care, we're going to try to do the right thing, even if it hurts, even if it's uncomfortable. And it's not just an American thing, because I'm going, you know, there are many different cultures that have that same mindset. But I have to say the whole devil may care, we're going to do this kind of thing, that is kind of an American mindset. And I'm going, you know, I haven't missed the States till I saw them throw those bikes on air. I'm like, I do miss that kind of attitude. But the, I think one of the reasons I kind of left the States when I did was I was seeing a lot less of that attitude. I was seeing a lot less of that can-do spirit. And I'm hoping it comes back with a vengeance. I'm like, I'm really hoping that we see more of that as time grows on. I don't know if we will, I don't know if we won't, but I'm like, I really liked that can-do spirit that was seen in this movie with the, the character of Alex, being an American, being from an immigrant family, being the kind of person who's like, I'm going to fight for this because I believe it's the right thing to do, and if other people decide to come against me, I'm still gonna fight for this. I'm like, I hadn't missed the U.S. for so long that I'm going, it's been like nine months, the same time as having a baby. And I'm like, I finally miss the States a little bit. I mean, even when I was in, in Vietnam for a while, I'm really not happy in Hanoi. <laughs> I'm like, those were kind of the worst 10 days of the last nine months. But I'm going, even then, I didn't really miss the States. But watching this movie, I'm like, I do kind of miss that part. So I'm really thankful for the people that made Red, Red, and Blue. I hope it's a rip roaring success. And I know this review is even longer than the movie itself, so I'm sorry. I kind of rambled on and on. But I hope you guys check out the movie. I will drop links in the description for the movie, for the book. You can also get a collector's edition of the book, which is available on eBay, etc. But this is my review of Red, Right, and Royal Blue. Check it at the round table. Bye!